We're back. We're back indeed. So coming up next, like the wallpaper said, is Dave Farley and reactive systems. So what I'm going to say about Dave is that Dave wrote the book on continuous delivery. And you know how I know that? No, because the book is called Continuous Delivery. And um, even more, he also has a company that's called Continuous Delivery. So Obviously, he knows what he's talking about. He definitely knows what he's talking about. So without further ado, let's welcome Dave to CodeCamp. Hello, Dave. Hi, how are you? Pretty swell, actually. Good. We're having <laughs> a good day. The weather. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Are we ready to go for my presentation? Should we? Absolutely. Yes, if you can share your content, we're good to go. We will do. Good. Uh, get me the right screen. Screen two, there's the one. Can you see my screen okay? Uh, we, yes, yes, it's, it's live. live. Good. Good. Uh, well, welcome everybody. So, so uh, despite my introduction, today I'm not really talking about continuous delivery. Uh, uh, today I'm going to be talking about reactive systems. Um, I had the privilege to be involved in one of those kind of career defining um, projects. I, I worked on building one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges. And while, while going through the process of that, we, we kind of learned a thing or two about, about advanced software architecture. And we came up with an idea uh, of, of, uh, that was kind of fairly novel, or, or at least it was to us. And then we got, got involved with some other people and I got involved in writing a thing called the Reactive Manifesto that described and tried to capture some of the ideas that we'd, that we'd come across while we were building our exchange. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So um, we're going to, uh, excuse me, right, okay, good. So uh, our world, I'll get the technology in order right now. Good. So, so our world is changing. Uh, uh, 15 years ago, a large application probably had tens of servers, worked in seconds of response times, and had hours for offline maintenance and probably dealt in gigabytes of data if it was very large. These days, that feels normal or small. Large applications these days have thousands of, uh, of processors, often in distributed heterogeneous network of devices, milliseconds of response time, 100% uptime, and dealing petabytes of data. Just looking at one dimension of this is kind of interesting. If you look at the, you know, the history of the recent history of data storage, um, it's, it's astronomical, the, the, the numbers that we can talk about. In the top left-hand corner, you can see uh, an SD card, an eight gigabyte SD card, resting on top of what's called a ferrite core memory unit. That ferrite core memory unit was the sort of thing that was used in computers in the, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and was used by NASA for some, of the, for some of the computers in spacecraft during that kind of era. Each little magnetic ring that you can see in that picture represents one bit. So you can see that's an, that's an eight by eight bit segment or something like that, uh, uh, just below that eight gigabyte uh, memory card. In the bottom right hand corner, there's another one of these things. Um, and th even this picture is out of date. I recently saw an advert for a, um, an SD card with two terabytes of storage on it. But in 2005, we've got on the left hand side, we've got 128 megabytes. Uh, 10 years later, less than 10 years later, we've got a thousand times the storage, 128 gigabytes of storage. So, so the, the, the nature of the computer systems that, uh, that our software run, runs upon is changing. I'm sorry, I'm... Uh... Ah, go back. One moment, please. Uh, right, okay. So, Let's, let's just understand a little bit what, what advancing in, in hardware capacity means for the kinds of systems that we build. Let's, and it's very hard to picture the sorts of numbers that we're talking about. So let's try to put this into perspective. I just want to play a little thought experiment. Let's imagine for a moment that one CPU cycle in our computer took one second. What would that mean for, for normal kinds of operations that we can understand? In reality, 
uh, what one CPU cycle takes is significantly faster than that. In reality, we're talking about a third of a nanosecond uh, take for a modern processor. A modern processor, this is a simplest, simplifying assumption, assuming that a modern processor is, is operating on one instruction per CPU cycle. Uh, it, it is, is kind of the, the basis of this kind of idea. So let's imagine that that took a second. A level one cache hit working in the in the RAM, the, the, the random access memory on the on the processor chip, the first level would take three seconds to access. A level two cache hit would take nine seconds to access. A level three cache hit, and we're still on the processor. Remember, we're still on that one piece of silicon would take 43 seconds to access. One of the huge advantage, advances of modern processes, the, the, the utility to which an awful lot of the transistors on modern processes are put, is just fast storage to try and optimize the rate at which you can get information to the processing core. And these, these, these multi-layer caches are part of that game. So now what happens if we go out to RAM, the, the, the RAM in our computers, and we want to, we got to, want to get a ma main memory access, we've missed the cache on the processor, that's going to take the equivalent of six minutes to retrieve that data at this one second CPU cycle. Let's imagine that we wanted to communicate between two computers across 10 meters of fiber with a modern high performance network. That's going to take 18 hours. Let's imagine that we want to retrieve some data from disk. Let's first think of what we all think of as the fast disks. Solid state disk, we're going to retrieve this from an SSD. It takes four days at one second per instruction. Let's imagine we're just, we're a bit old fashioned and we're using spinning rust for our storage. That's going to take six months to access the data from that hard disk. If we wanted to send a message between uh, across the internet between London and Australia, opposite sides of the planet, that's going to take the equivalent of 19 years for that message just to arrive, just the latency of the network and the speed of light to get it from one side of the planet to the other on this time scale takes 19 years. Let's imagine we're rebooting our computer. We've had a blue screen of death and we're restarting it. 31,000 years is how long we'd have to wait if our, if our processors were ticking at just one second per, per instruction. This kind of puts the amount of stuff that's going on in, in our modern systems into some kind of human scale. It's staggering the level of stuff that's going on. As a famous physicist once said, there's room at the bottom. There's an awful lot of things that are going on lower down. So the reactive manifesto and reactive systems that we built for our exchange were kind of built on trying to understand the idea of taking advantage of, of the performance of modern hardware. We came up with an idea called, that we called mechanical sympathy, meaning that we wanted to try and make changes in line with the hardware that we were working with and take advantage of those hardware. Of the hardware. And that led us to some make some certain kinds of architectural decisions. Later, when we worked on the Reactive Manifesto, um, we, came, we came up with this model. And the, the kind of tagline for the Reactive Manifesto was 21st century problems are not best solved with 20th century software architectures. The hardware has moved to such a degree that some of those hard, hardware architectures, sorry, those software architectures make less sense these days with the kind of scale of systems and performance that we're talking about. So if we're looking for reactive systems, what we're looking for are responsive systems. They need to be, they need to keep delivering responses at a predictable, efficient, effective uh, rate. We want them to continue being responsive in the face of stress. So we want them to be resilient under stress. And we'd like them to scale up as demand goes up or down. They'd like to, they, we're going to maintain that responsiveness and make those the scaling of those systems elastic. And one of the ideas that kind of underpins all of the these other uh, principles is the idea that they need to be message driven, and that allows us to achieve some of these other ends. So let's look in, into each of those ideas in a little bit more depth.
So reactive systems are responsive. They respond in a timely manner. This is really a cornerstone of usability, but it also means that reactive systems can be very quick to detect problems. Um, they remain responsive in the face of failure and resilience depends on ideas like replication, containment, isolation and delegation to achieve that. They're elastic, they're going to respond responsive under varying workload. They're going to respond to change in the input rate by increasing the number of resources that are there to service it. That relies on kind of distributed, decentralized architectures with no contention points and no central bottlenecks. And message driven. And by that, on the whole, what we meant when we were talking about the reactive, in terms of the reactive manifesto, was asynchronous message driven. Asynchrony is an important idea, and I'm going to explore that in some more detail as we go through this presentation. But also, but, but one of the things that it gives us is loose coupling, uh, both in terms of time and location. So the, 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 these, the services that we're talking about are going to be isolated uh, from, it, from one another. They're going to be lo locally transparent, meaning that we can move them in, in different places and still uh, converse with them and get behavior, which gives us that elastic uh, ability. So some of the properties of reactive systems that we're interested in, they're flexible, loosely coupled, scalable. I would argue easier to develop, although many people would disagree with me. We'll go through some examples and you can make your own mind up. Uh, they're more tolerant of failure than conventional systems, for sure. They respond to failure gracefully and, and, and they will carry on working you know, in isolated areas of the system, even when other areas are kind of on the floor and doing, not, uh, do, doing no, no useful work. And they remain responsive to users uh, in, 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 in useful ways. This is, a, this is an interesting idea and we, we, we tend to think of these sorts of architectural patterns as large, sc large scale system patterns, but on the whole, this is, this is not really true of reactive systems. Reactive systems are kind of fractal and it goes, it goes very deep. The, 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 the little picture on the screen is kind of an icon that was sometimes used for a, a very old um, uh, CPU design called a transputer, which was a, a multi-core, massively parallel, um, uh, 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 very simple CPUs in mass, massive parallel systems um, that was designed back in the, uh, back in the 1980s. Um, this is also at the heart of the way that modern CPUs work. Modern CPUs are parallel devices. They have we, we are increasingly having multiple co cores. We, we, we can't increase the, the clock cycle anymore for CPUs because we've hit the limits of, of physics in the silicon, uh, or, or at least you know, heat, problems of heat generation limit the degree to which we can scale those. But we can keep adding um, transistors and we can kind of make more, uh, modern processes uh, be more parallel. So modern processes have multiple cores and those cores talk to each other via asynchronous messaging over message buses. That's the, the QPI bus that coordinates the work of the processors is such a device. So it's kind of, so uh, the, these are a form of reactive system. So let's start thinking about what this means in terms of this, this uh, uh, um, uh, messaging problem. And the, the pattern of, of software development that most of us are, are, are familiar with and, and we learn from, the, from our first steps in programming is one of synchronous messaging. In a system like this, where we've got two components that want to exchange information via synchronous messaging, where are the points where it can go wrong? Well, we could, we could have a bug here where this, in, where this red X is in component A. We could have a problem trying to establish the connection to the remote component B. We could lose information in transmission between component A and component B. Component B could have had a problem connecting to, to the system. There might be a bug in component B, and then we have the mirror of all of those failure points on the way back to component A. Now, the difficulty with this is that in a distributed system, the only parts of uh, the only failure points that component A can concretely identify and rectify are the ones circled in yellow. 
it can respond to defects it has of its own. It can respond to its inability to form a connection. It can respond to a bug that it has on handling a response. But all of the rest of the failures are outside of its view and it can't really cope with those. So what could we do instead? Synchronous comms, because of these reasons, synchronous communications increases the coupling in both location and time. There's another problem here. If we've got these two components talking to one another, then what's going to happen is that when compo component A is invoked by some, some for, to carry out some piece of behavior, it's going to start working on that piece of behavior. And at some point, it's going to need to interact with component B via a synchronous call. Now it's got to freeze. It's got to wait while component B does its job. It's going to transmit the message. Component B is going to get triggered. Um, and it can't do anything until component B responds. It's frozen in, in terms of the state of that interaction. So in order to scale a system like this up, what do we do? In a synchronous system, what we tend to do is that we, we add parallelism. We add, we add multiple threads that allow us to operate those. Now we've got another problem. Now we've got one of the hardest problems in, in computing, that of concurrent programming, in the core of our problem domain um, because of this technical difficulty with the communications mechanism. It means that component A has become lots more complicated than it was before, and is still tied to the efficiency of all of these things. Asynchrony give us some other options. So let's imagine we've got the same kind of pattern. We're going to have a call into component A. Component A is going to send an asynchronous message to component B. Component A is now free to do new work. It doesn't matter whether that work is to handle the response from component B or new work coming in for some other, for, for some other purpose. Sometime later in the future, component B is going to respond. And that's cool. Uh, so what about the failure mode? So again, component A could have a bug. We could have a failure to, to establish a connection. Um, and component A knows about those. If we can trust our messaging systems to deliver the information from component A to component B, then that's cool. That's, that, that gives us what we need. We're able to, component A can be self-contained and rely on the messaging system. If component B wasn't there, if the information was lost in transmission, the infrastructure can take, that, take care of that on our behalf. One of the other outcomes of this is that the most efficient way of writing a service like this is to make it single threaded. That sounds weird. That sounds that sounds odd when we're thinking about high performance computing. But we did, when we were building our exchange, we did the measurements. Single threaded uh, single threaded operation is by far the fastest route to the most efficient way to use the user resources at our disposal. If we can organize our work so that there's never a synchronization point, we can do work in parallel, but as long as there's no point at which there is shared data, there's no point at which we're pulling back a synchronization point um, uh, between these two points, then single threaded is by far the fastest. We worked out through measurement that it was about um, uh, about 100 times, between 100 and 1,000 times faster to do work on a single thread than it was to use even the fastest uh, mechanism, so lock-free programming techniques to coordinate shared state between threads. So, so single threaded is very fast and efficient uh, way of working. It's also incredibly simple. It keeps the programming model much simpler because all it needs to do is worry about the state on that single thread. So if we're able to write our component A and go from an input asynchronous message, process that message on a single thread as quickly and as efficiently as we can, just a simple series of steps, a simple domain model that's able to process that information and generate a new message on the way out, that's going to be a really efficient way of writing that piece of code and actually a fairly simple programming model.
so we're going to do this as quickly as we can. We're going to make these 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 routes really fast, and we're going to pass these through the component. So let's look at a, a, a slightly more practical example, because by now I would imagine you're thinking, OK, but how does this work in a real program? So let's imagine that we're going to uh, we, we've got a bookstore and we've got an inventory, a warehouse or whatever, where the book, the physical books are stored. And we're going to have a message coming in saying we're going to order a book called continuous delivery. If this is a synchronous system, the bookstore is going to call to the inventory and it say reserve the continuous delivery book. And it can't really respond back until it's got an answer back from the inventory. So if the inventory is, the, the bookstore is blocked. So if the inventory is being slow or if there's been a problem with the inventory, if a, if a satellite, a, a meteorites crashed into the data center where the inventory was running or something, then we, 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 we kind of screwed. We can't really make any more progress. The bookstore can't take any more orders. For a moment, I just, I just want you to think about how weird that is in the real world. I'm talking to you at the moment and, and um, I'm, I'm conveying inform information. Your brain isn't frozen and stopped waiting, uh, waiting for some kind of response. You know, if I ask you a question, my brain isn't stopped waiting for a response. We are thinking independently of, of, of other. We continue to doing processing. The world is moving on, and at some time later, we'll get we'll, we'll exchange some more information and we'll carry on working. I think that synchronicity in the way in which we think of it, synchronous invocation is actually a really quite weird idea when you start thinking of it in those sorts of terms. And it's quite alien to the real world. The real world is asynchronous. Stuff just keeps happening. So if we start thinking about that and modeling that in, in the way in which we model our systems, we can gain some advantages. So in the second example, here's my asynchronous message saying I want to place an order for the book continuous delivery and I'm going to process that and I'm going to send a reserve message to the inventory. Now the bookstore is free. I can place another message. I can place other orders or I can receive the answer back from the inventory saying the book's been ordered and, the, and then I can forward that ordered message back out to, to the, the user that, that requested it. A good pattern for doing this is to manage this as a little bit of state. So the order comes in for the book. I'm going to change the state of the book in my bookstore to reserving. I'm now going to forward a reserve message to the inventory. The inventory is going to send me a response maybe and I can change the state when I get it. But I could also be processing a different book. Here's an order for another book reserving better, better aerobatics. The inventory is working on it. The bookstore is still making progress. The inventory hasn't answered yet. When the inventory gets round to it, I've ordered continuous delivery. I change the state of the book in the bookstore to ordered and I message out what's going on. Now, I want to remind you, one of the things when people see these kinds of patterns that go through their heads is this sounds really slow. But I want to remind you that what we're talking about here is faster because there's less work going on. In most normal cases, if everything's working smoothly, the user is going to get responses more quickly, not more slowly than they would otherwise. If there's a problem, though, if there's a problem with the inventory, then our system will be more resilient. This kind of pattern of services as state machines is extremely useful, very common, very simple. And it allows us to use the domain level semantics of the interactions. We can migrate state of the domain model based on message input and only message input, generate events on the result of state changes and run the business logic all on a single thread, which kind of reminded me of, sort of going back to the early days of my programming career when, when software systems that we built were simpler or single threaded anyway. Just to play that out one, you know, one more, one step further. So here's a, here's a kind of sequence diagram. We're going to place an order for the book. We're going to do some processing and change the state of the book to ordering. When that's done, we're going to send a message to the inventory to reserve the book. The inventory is going to do some processing to reserve, send a message back saying that the book's been reserved. Now the bookstore can change the, the, the state of the book to ordered and signal out to the user that the book was ordered. If something bad happened, if the inventory had been destroyed and all of these things had kind of uh, uh, failed in some way, then we're in this state. 
the the the, the book the, the, the order's been placed the bookstore has the order it's got the state the, the the book it says i've already sent the message to reserve the book and now if the, if the inventory was down for a long time, we could imagine writing some behaviours that said, OK, so so we, we probably need some behaviours that allow us to understand what happens if we're stuck in this position. So we could write some behaviours in the bookstore to say, have you got any books that are have been in an ordering state for more than a few seconds? And then you could decide what to do with them or something like that. Notice all of these behaviours are kind of domain level problems. It services the real domain level problems in a, in a distributed system. So we could say list books by state of ordering and decide what to do in, in that kind of world. Sometime later, a new version of the inventory is recreated. We've rebuilt our data center after the meteorite crashed into it and started the inventory up again. As long as we have infrastructure that's able to replay those messages that were sent, then the inventory will get the message to reserve the continuous delivery book. It can place the order, it can say it's reserved. And as far as the bookstore's concerned, the processing that it undertakes now is identical to if the inventory had res responded immediately. So both of these pieces are in each independently more resilient than they would have been had they been coupled together through a synchronous interaction of some kind. This model works really well. But in order for it to work, we need to be very confident in our messaging and the messaging needs to deliver these properties. They need to, it needs to maintain the order in which we receive messaging. We need to provide deterministic state changes in each of our services. We only, we only respond to messages along these channels. We don't share state any other way. And the messages need to be durable in the sense that if there's some problem, the messaging system will later deliver the messages that, that were missed. There are a variety of ways uh, of achieving this, and I'm not going to go into those in any depth uh, today because we don't really have time. Uh, but there's some good stuff about uh, about that. And if you look at LMAX, which is where we built our, uh, our system, uh, uh, Martin Fowler wrote an article that describes some of the techniques that we used to 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 fulfil some of these things. Um, the isolation that we're talking about allows us to decouple in time and space. We, we've got the space separation, as I've just described, between the, the bookstore and the inventory. But in location two, where we brought up the inventory, as long as the messaging system knows how to direct traffic, that's not a problem that the bookstore needs to understand. And so it's an inf it's a problem that we've moved out of the uh, out of the the service that's doing business transactions and into the the infrastructure. It means that we get to kind of focus on communication over well-defined protocols and kind of think about the abstractions of the conversations that take place. Isolation is kind of interesting. It takes us another place, other place though. We want to try and avoid this kind of pattern where components are sharing information through some other channel. They're only going to communicate via these asynchronous messages if we want to build a genuinely reactive system. So we don't want this kind of shared storage uh, approach. Instead, we're going to make each component responsible in some way for its own storage. And that's kind of you can think of that as being part of the storage of the, of the system. When we start thinking about that and we're thinking about the boundaries of the system, we're going to talk to these. We, we, we're not going to share any state beyond other than via messages. It means that each component could decide how it deals with its storage needs itself. If one requires a column store and another requires a relational database or a graph database, that's fine. It means that that's within the boundaries of that component and it's nobody else's business what's going on. This might sound a bit like microservices, and I think these are a style of microservice in some circumstance, although there are other attributes that maybe are a little bit more different, a little bit more specific in reactive systems. There's another step forward we can take, though. If we take this idea uh, really seriously of only communicating via the messages, we can simplify the programming model even further. We can do away with the data store tied to the component altogether. What do I mean by that? So we've got a message coming in that's going to mutate the state of component A. 
There's nothing else that can change the state of component A other than an asynchronous message coming in. That was part of the definition that I mentioned before. And there's going to be a, and component A is going to generate messages going out. That's it. Those are the responsibilities of component A in this model. So what does that mean? It means we could treat component A as a black box. We can record the messages going in and store them somewhere. The domain model of component A is the, the focus. That's all we really need to worry about. That's the business logic of the system isolated from the technical dependencies. So it means that we've got this strong domain model of, of our problem implemented in the service, and that's all we really need to think about. Then we can do really smart things in terms of isolating and separating the accidental complexity of running on a computer from that core domain model essential complexity. If we need the state of component A to be durable, we need to be able to recreate it. When we, If we shut the computer down and start it up again, we can record the stream of messages coming in, store them somewhere safe. If there's a problem uh, uh, and we want to re reconstitute the version of component A, or, re, uh, or restart it in some way with a new version. Then we can replay the messages from that data store. And from component A's point of view, it looks exactly the same. So it allows us this separation of the essential complexity from the accidental complexity, more so than any other approach to, to software design that I've come across. We can also think about moving ideas like clustering uh, uh, and do persistence that way. We can have multiple copies of component A that have the rich state based on the stream of messages. As long as we manage the stream of messages, this kind of event sourced architecture um, uh, on steroids will allow us to, to reliably contain the state of our systems. When we built our, our financial exchange, as I said in my introduction, it's one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges. And when we built our, our exchange, the system of record for customer accounts and the state of a market in which trading took place were, was the in-memory state of these components. They, those pieces of code knew nothing about how information was stored on their behalf. That problem was moved out to the infrastructure completely. And so these things could, they were clustered, distributed across multiple uh, copies of, of, of the, the server, persisted and so on. Even disaster recovery was kind of moved out as an infrastructural concern. Moving on, you can't really isolate stress, uh, it, it, and so you need to take the, in these circumstances. So if, we, if we've got a component that's got too many messages come in, we need to signal upstream to indicate that the system's under stress and needs to, that, that, that the rate at which things uh, come in, uh, messages come in needs to slow down. We communicate that back. Ultimately, we may need to communicate that, that all the way back to the user, but there's no way if we want our system to be resilient as well as responsive to isolate stress. A classic anti-pattern that, that we often see in people building high perform or large scale systems is to just increasing the sizes of queues when, when the system comes under load. And that's all that's doing is delaying the time at which things are going to fall over. You can't build resilient systems with unbounded queues. You need to cope with those problems in other ways. And so back pressure is a key idea of resilience for these kinds of reactive systems. Once we've kind of got this separation, we've got these behaviors inside each of these components focused just on the business behavior of that component, it gives us many opportunities to do other things. So we could imagine we've got component A talking to component B and, and, it's, and it's processing all of this load. Uh, and let's imagine that component B starts finding that the demand's a bit too heavy for it. We get, you know, demand's higher than we thought. We can get two versions of component B. We can do something smart in our, in, in our traffic routing, separate the traffic into different, different groups, and we can shard the, res the, res the resource sets component B. Again, this is 
transparent to both component A and component B. The coding inside each one of those components is identical. But we've separated out the problem of scalability and made that a problem for the infrastructure rather than a problem for the components themselves. So what does this really look like in, in a real world system? So we're going to have a, a components and, and some, some infrastructure to manage the messaging, which is what these little rings are meant to, meant to indicate that based on ideas of ring buffers, which is one of the techniques that we use when we built our exchange. We have messages coming in and processed. Maybe they'll go to multiple components and they'll be having a conversation with other components, maybe a gateway component like component D down, down here that's going to translate things and send out external messages via HTTP in this case. And some components will be storing data uh, in offlines, uh, you know, maybe the, an archive component. Others will be will, will be live and just in an in-memory state. And there might be circles back, so the, 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 there might be routes through. All of these kind of patterns are useful and, and applicable in building real-world systems. Here's another kind of take on this. This is a, a very, very high-level schematic of the exchange that we built. We had separate zones in the uh, message buses to, for security reasons. We had the core services in the middle that represented the systems of record. And as I said before, we had the execution management service, which was, the, which was a high performance part of the system dealing with customers' accounts. The state of that system, which was a primary part of the business state of our, uh, of our enterprise, was the in-memory state of these rich domain models within these services. Similarly, the execution venue where the markets operated. And then we had a bunch of more conventional services, database backed or, or file system backed and so on. At the edges of the system, we had kind of translators, adapters that would translate information to a form that was useful to the outside world. So we got this model of kind of core services, general services and gateway services that would act as translation points into and out of the conversation as it was going on in our system. If you're interested in learning more about these kinds of systems, I think the, I think it's fair to say that this is a this is a a pattern that's kind of still reasonably uh, leading edge, and there's there, there you know you need to you need to hunt around a little bit to learn from these. But Acker is uh, the, the people from Acker uh, and Lightbend are the are the people that we wrote the reactive manifesto with. Their stuff using actor based patterns is very similar. Um, my, my, my colleague where we worked on the exchange together, Martin Thompson, has been working with friends to build uh, Aeron, a high performance messaging system that's built on these ideas. You can build these kinds of systems using Kafka and one of, uh, one of our vendors who sold us our, 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 our web tools built something called Baratine, Baratine, which was again built on these ideas because he liked the, um, uh, the architecture that we were doing. Another interesting source of information there's a movement that's starting to be talked about uh, about stateful serverless and i think if my take on stateful serverless is correct then this is gives an opportunity to build forms of reactive systems using these stateful serverless models and i i would i would say this is it's fairly early days for the stateful serverless stuff but i'd keep keep an eye out on that and finally uh, one of my colleagues on, on the Reactive Manifesto, uh, Roland Kuhn, wrote the, this, this excellent book, Reactive Design Patterns, which is a source of really good information. Um, uh, that's my presentation. I think we have uh, probably a few minutes for q and if, if there are any questions. Um, Absolutely. No, I was going to say no, sorry, Dave. That's <laughs> but we do have questions. A few. Yeah, well, I think first things, uh, it's an appreciation for somebody who's uh, who's really sorry for watching so many cat videos. They came to that realization uh, after watching your mechanical uh, sympathy segment. So on behalf of them, thank you. <laughs> That's why it takes 36,000 years to talk to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely, because of the cats. Well, uh, there's, there, there are also other questions. <laughs> and uh, one of them is, what is your opinion on uh, object-oriented programming? And if you think that the way uh, OOP is uh, tra traditionally thought, taught, thought and taught, 
uh, it goes against the nature of the systems of, of many systems and of doing simpler architectures. Uh, that's an interesting question. That's not yeah. how I perceive how I perceive object oriented programming. I consider myself an old school object oriented programmer. Uh, the the key here is interesting. So so when um, uh, when object oriented orientation was kind of first thought about and conceived, what they talked about was message passing. They didn't talk about functions or, 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 or you know, me uh, member functions or anything like this. They talked about message passing. And I think that what I'm describing, one take on what I'm describing is a very, very pure object oriented system. If you imagine, so you, 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 you putting together behavior and state um, inside these little bubbles, but just the, be the behavior and state are, you know, based on the domain model. And then you're externalizing all of the all of the rest of the, the kind of accidental complexity around that into into the infrastructure and the, the service mesh, if you want, in which in which these 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 bubbles of of logic operate. Um, and so I think of that as a fairly pure object oriented kind of approach. I think one of the idea when I I, I, I I described this idea to, to, to one of my friends, Eric Evans, who wrote the Domain Driven Design book some years ago. And, and, and at the time, you know, he was he was very interested on, on what we would found uh, in terms of this, because what it leads to is kind of the purest form of domain driven design within the context of those those services or components that you create. Um, and and I you know I I think that I think that's a, that's a powerful idea. It's one of the it's one of the things that I really enjoyed in this programming model that, that that we found by accident really. It wasn't what we were necessarily seeking, but it's where we ended up in terms of trying to build something that was fast enough um, and you know and buildable to, to solve our problem. Thank you. Yeah, it, <laughs> it makes sense. Um, I That's think we next. Uh, that, I think go for this one. Yeah, uh, we're a bit wondering because the the next question was, uh, do you recommend any proven frameworks for building reactive systems? But you all already recommended uh, some of those frameworks, so I think that's yeah. pretty much answered. Yeah, and and I I do still think it's early days. I don't think that yet. I think the most advanced one is the stuff from Lightbend. So Acker and and um, and their tooling. I've forgotten what the other one's called uh, at the moment. But but their sets of products are are the are the best, the, the most mature at the moment. There are some things in terms of the programming model that I would. I, I think there are, there are there's a route to simpler programming models than they have in some in, in some degrees. It's it's a minor difference in opinion between uh, between the the Lightbend folks and and, and me anyway. Uh, and and so. I'm, I think there's room for some more mature uh, models and infrastructure around this, and I expect it to come. I, I think that the Aeron stuff is heading in a slightly different direction, but it's going to end up with something similar in terms of a very resilient, uh, fast, high performance service mesh in which to build these sorts of systems. All right. Um, here's another one. Uh, when using uh, messaging systems, would it be faster if we ignored ordering versus messaging infrastructure usually usually is running asynchronously? Uh, it's an interesting question, and in some circumstances that may be true, but it makes the, the modeling of the it makes the modeling much more complicated in terms of how you're going to cope with things. If you haven't got ordering, I'm not. I can't really get my head around where you end up. You're you're kind of into into a weird kind of world, you know, concurrency world. So so instead, I think you go for very strict ordering and item potence. You make sure that you you can process a message only only once. You get it in order and only once. And that makes the models that you build much much simpler. Just take a trivial example. If if we do, if we ignore ordering and we're building a bank account. And I say I'm going to add ten pounds to my bank account, uh, and then I'm going to take five pounds away. Um, maybe that was, that's okay in terms of ordering, but 
maybe it's not. Maybe, you know, what what if what, what if I've you know I, I've gone overdrawn at some point in that transaction, and so and so on, because I took the five pounds away before before I added the ten pounds. So sequencing kind of matters in these things, I think. Yeah, it's one of those things that uh, might go be well in theory, but in practice it doesn't work out. Yes. Um, Vlad, what do you have next? I think we, we still have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, well, this is uh, interesting. In the services as a state machines example, um, if it takes a long time for the inventory to recover from the, the meteor hit, and there are a lot of state changes in uh, queue, is having a single threaded inventory service still a good idea? Yeah, yes, because it's still the most efficient. So, the, so there's some interesting, there's some interesting st uh, stuff uh, uh, on this. It's dramatically more efficient to run changes on a single thread than on multiple threads if you ever have to join the results together. So the kinds of things that you want to scale out on multiple threads are the kinds of jobs where you never need to join stuff together. So my Netflix viewing history versus your Netflix viewing history never have to relate to one another. They don't matter uh, in, you know, in, in, any, in any useful sense. So if we want to be able to bring things back together again, then the, the just orders of magnitude kind of numbers, if you're going to use kind of lock free programming techniques, very low level, very, very difficult to get right, the territory of concurrency experts, you're going to be about a hundred to a thousand times slower than processing on a single thread. So the 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 efficiency gain that you get by going just to two threads with lock-free concurrency needs to give you a hundred to a thousand times gain in efficiency, which you don't get. So so the, so going what going more parallel does not scale up. It does it doesn't work as a, if you're going to a lock. It's thousands or tens of thousands of times slower to use an operating system level lock to synchronize two threads of execution. It's dramatic. We, we, we made this mistake. The reason that I know this stuff is because we started off with the assumptions that everybody has. We, we built a very parallel version of our exchange using a, an, a, an architecture approach called CEDA, staged event driven architecture. And we measured the fact that we spent more time trying to figure out which thread to do work on than we did doing work, which is when we dumped all the infrastructure and just did work on one thread. One thread per service, not one thread across the whole system. Of course. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, always uh, simple things are, are more efficient than uh, complex <laughs> things, <laughs> right? In this case, dramatically so. <laughs> Wait, Vlad, I have to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, there's another interesting question Well, that, that basically says, um, in an event-based system, reactive system, uh, the best language would be a language that has an event loop by default, but still we have problems with uh, with managing the content based events. What algorithms are applicable to uh, to be able to manage the scalability for for the back pressure between components? I got lost at the end. I'm not sure if it made sense to you. Yeah, and no, I, I, I think I understand. I think I understand the question. The first thing that I would say is that I don't think that this is a language is issue. For the kinds of event-based systems that we are talking about, we're putting the event loop outside of the service. So you have a you have a one or more you know asynchronous message entry points into a into a service or a component. The service or component on a single thread processes that incoming stuff. It can be stateful if it wants, whatever it wants, and it sends a new event out. That's it. So there's no loop. The loop is outside of the service. So you can do that. You, you put that into the infrastructure. The back pressure, the work that's being done in things like um, ACA and Aeron is the back pressure is externalized. So when it notices that things are under load, the service is, is responsible for signaling to the infrastructure that you know if it's under stress in some way but then that mess the messaging can be communicated back up the back up the, the chain of invocation to upstream services and they can react however they need to so in 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 actor patterns you have um 
you have kind of overseers, you have actors, directors, if you like, that are kind of directing the activities of the, of the actors in some degree, some degree. And if they see that the actors are having trouble, they can kind of bring new actors onto the new scene so they can scale things up and, and so on. So you, you can imagine those sorts of behaviours, again, outside of the, each of the little services. Thank you. Yes, yeah, fair point. Uh, I think we cut a bit in the break, but I have to ask one more yeah. question. Hope it's okay, Dave. Um, what is your take on mixing asynchronous or message-driven uh, with synchronous messaging, like direct or REST calls within a system? Should the system be purely asynchronous? Yes, the, the system should be purely asynchronous. We made this mistake. So, so I made this mistake personally. So I wrote the first version of the um, the abstraction, the, the, the service abstraction for, for our exchange. And I built it assuming that we would want to support both asynchronous and synchronous communications. And all, nearly all of the difficult problems that we had was as a result of the synchronous channels, not the asynchronous. So dump the synchronous communications within the models, within the model. If you, if you, where you've got to talk to a synchronous system, uh, you know, an external REST API or something like that, then create one of these gateway services that does the translation points and kind of translates between a you know, request response and an, an input message and, and a separate in, independent output message. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Very insightful. Uh, again, if like uh, Sandra, if you have some time uh, afterwards, you can just go in the chat. There are a few questions that we didn't get to answer, to ask. <laughs> and also answer. And also answer. <laughs> Uh, I'll take, and, yeah, thank you. thanks a lot for being here. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Hope to do it again, maybe even in person at some point. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs>